Ladies and gentlemen, colleagues, guests, very welcome here in Barcelona. Even if it's a little bit advanced in time and in the evening, I think we have an extremely interesting topic to discuss in this symposium. It's called it's a benchmark symposium, which, my, which means it's very important. It's from Berlin Hart, a leader, maybe a world leader in paracorporeal technology. And we all know, even if we do much more implantable devices, that we definitely need these devices. 20 years ago, I made a paper about renewal and rejuvenation from, from these uh, devices. And now we could say it's uh, the second renewal because the patients we see get worse and worse. And the only thing uh, to save these patients is to put in paracorporeal devices. And for example, in my institution, we put in more paracorporeal devices than implantable because the patients are extremely in an extremely poor condition. So we have gathered um, around a group of experts coming from Germany, Italy, and uh, Sweden. It's uh, Christian Hagel from Munich, Ugolino Ligi from Udine, uh, Jan Rupava from Essen, Sven-Erik Bartfey comes remotely from Göteborg, and Jens Gabade from Bremen. I think we have five wonderful experts, and uh, we just go through these five uh, presentations, and at the end, we will do a discussion in form of a panel discussion. So once again, very welcome here to this Berlin Heart Expert Meeting, and I'd like to introduce as the first speaker, Professor Christian Hagel from Munich, with the topic X-Core in Intermex 1 patients. Christoph, ladies and gentlemen, first of all, I want to thank the organizers for the invitation and the privilege to share with you our ex expertise and experience in the X-Core implantation in Intermax 1 patients. And this is my agenda for the next couple of minutes. I'm going to show you some interesting aspects from the Intermax annual report 2019. Furthermore, I would like to remind you on the definition of Intermax 1. I will show you the shortcomings and um, try to convince you that uh, we do have to rethink the definition. Furthermore, we want to show you some ideas about the VAT treatment options and finally our data, 15 years experience of XCOR as a bridge to transplantation. This was published in 2020, and most of you will probably know over the past five years, centrifugal flow. VATs have become the dominant technology, and destination therapy is now more frequently than um, the bridge to transplantation. The distribution of Intermax profiles remained predominantly between two and three. I think in Germany it's more between one and two, but the results are good anyway, and as what you can appreciate here is 12-month survival of 82% and the three-year survival of 63%. So everybody would expect that a number of patients will be referred by the cardiologist, but the opposite is true. Look at these. Patients receiving implants in 2017 and 2018 compared to the period before were more likely to be at Intermax Profile 1 and had MCS prior to implantation. What does that mean? It means that a substantial amount of patients missed the right moment with all consequences for an impaired outcome. And what is the reason for that? Um, it's probably be multifactorial, but one is maybe um, the definition of Intermax 1, because I think it's too crude overall. Let me just remind you, this is the definition of Intermax 1. It's life-threatening, it's a hypotension, um, it's escalating inotropes with critical organ hypoperfusion, kidney, liver, and gut, and it's called the critical cardiogenic shock. But the Intermax 1 clinical presentation can be very diverse. So right heart failure can be a problem, can be a severe problem, um, you often have in septic circulation, vasopressor dependence, low vascular resistance, 
and then you have a failed kidney or a failed liver, usually you have a chronic problem, and then you have an acute one on top of the chronic one, and often patients are mechanically ventilated, they have pneumonia, pleural effusions, and the lactate levels are pretty high. That this all has an effect could be shown in 2015 in this paper, 12,000 patients, and you see exactly the risk factors, intermax level, the kidney failure, the liver problems, um, and the need for ARVAT. These are all um, uh, with a high hazard ratio um, causing death or more death in this group. Is there a need for a subclassification, and is there a possibility for that? And I think this I got from Aris Menon. Thank you very much for that. Um, there is something, and this comes from cardiology. It's interesting, but Society of Thoracic Surgeons were also involved in that. And this is all cardiogenic shock. And if you look at C, D, and E, and I want to go through that for time reasons, um, but all are Intermax 1 level patients, and they are completely different. The ones get something under resuscitation. The others were on high anotropes, but also ECMO transport and everything. So what are the options for Intermax 1 patients? There are many um, combinations possible. Some make no sense, as you can see here, like the, the continuous flow VAT with temporary ECMO. Um, it makes sense if you just um, put it in the right atrium in the pulmonary artery. Um, others try just to start with two continuous flow. This is off-label use. And then the, the, the working horse, we have heard that before um, from Christoph, the pulsatile um, device, the Berlin Heart, which works pretty well in our hands. And the pulsatile bivet, um, I'm going to show you the data later. And maybe total artificial heart is something for the future. Uh, but I'm not 100% sure because the sizing itself is a problem, especially if you have smaller um, patients. What did we learn and what are facts from the literature? One is among patients who develop acute right, uh, right heart failure after Elbert uh, implantation, in 50% of these patients, they were not, we are not able to wean them. So what to do with these patients? You put another vat in and then you are in trouble and people are going to die. Um, the other one, the second one, um, is um, international experience in patients with continuous flow devices. 93 patients, survival was not that bad, 56 after one year and 47 after two years, but the patients were not that sick. It was not intermax level one. There were some in, in this group, but uh, not that many. And the last one, I think, is, is very important, and it's really underestimated. Um, these are pretty old data, 1996, as you can see here, the pulsatility plays definitely a role. And um, I would like to, to revive this thinking about the pulsatility and the effects, especially in the very sick patients. And just briefly, um, this is um, our data, um, our cohort, 15 years of experience, 97 bivet implantation overall. We ended up in uh, analyzing um, 80 patients in Intermax level one. These were all adults, and as you can see here, 43 died and 37 were successfully bridged to heart um, transplantation. What were the criteria for bivet implantation? It was always a combination of uh, a number of factors like the tricuspid regurgitation, high pressure in the right atrium, uh, and the end organ dysfunction, often in conjunction with uh, higher lactate levels. In ECLS patients, it's always the problem that you can't wean the patients, and then you have to decide what to do with them, and then a bivert burning heart is, in my opinion, a good solution. Um, this is MCS type before the bivet implantation. As you can see here, the intraortic balloon pump, this was in the early days. We're not doing that anymore. Nowadays, you would use the ECLS or in combina combination with um, Impeller. These are the patients um, on the left side. Um, you can appreciate age, 46 years. Majority are males, different indications for bivet implantation, and uh, you see the poor um, uh, 
kidney function, um, you can will realize that the, the leukocyte blood count showing that there is some kind of an infection is increased, and 30% uh, of the patients are on dialysis, and 20% uh, uh, needed a reoperation, meaning they were operated by a median stenotomy prior to um, the implantation. Um, what were the risk factors? And we were just looking at those who survived, the others who were not surviving. And you see the BMI played a role, this, um, the, the leukocyte blood count showing that there's some kind of infection, especially in those, the positivity may be um, successful and, and a, a good tool. And then the last one, the dialysis and uh, the reoperation, which is just a, a technical aspect. The mean duration of support was 63 days. Uh, this comes from the early days. Nowadays, we have to wait much longer because you can't get hearts for these patients. And you see in the whole group, only seven being on the device for more than six months. And uh, the rules changed in Germany, as you all know. So it's not that easy mere to get them on a high urgent level. Um, so this will be a different situation. The 30-day survival is 70% um, and one year 41. It's not that good, but just to remind you that many of them were transplanted before. Um, of the 60 patients, uh, as I said, 32 died, 28 could be successfully bridged to transplant, and the causes of death are multifactorial, as you know from these patients. Interesting, and I think these are pretty good data, is the one-year survival of the heart transplantation from BIVET was 78%, um, and I think this is uh, really um, something remarkable. There were a number of adverse events. This is always happening. Um, as you can see here, um, there is some bleeding. Um, we had that in the earlier days, more bleeding. It's not that um, frequent anymore, but pump thrombosis is still a problem which we have to solve and we just have to, um, to replace um, the pump. But we are very aggressive in these cases to avoid uh, problems uh, with stroke or um, other things. The recovery of the second organs, um, very important. Um, you see it for the, for the kidney on the left side and for the liver on the right side. Uh, even after four weeks, um, there is a rapid improvement of the function of, um, of both the organ systems, meaning that this is a kind of a preconditioning for the um, transplantation. And that is probably one of the reasons why the transplantation at the end was pretty um, successful. What are the conclusions? Um, just a few ones here. The, compared to the continuous flow devices, the x provides the real cardiac output. Everybody knows that. Um, the high positive cardiac output is sufficient um, for an early recovery of secondary organ function. I showed that for the liver um, and uh, um, for, um, for the kidney. Um, the pulsatile BVAT can generate a very high cardiac output, which I think is very important, especially in those who are in a septic um, condition, so you can overcome sepsis and reduce resistance. Um, we speculate, and this comes from, from animal research, that pulsatile vats improve the microcirculation and the risk for gastrointestinal complications. We have shown that um, patients can be bridged with, um, with this device and that the results are, are pretty good. And um, reoperations, the high body mass index, renal failure are the, the classical risk factors for the adverse outcome. And as I mentioned before, I think a subclassification of Intermax is necessary to um, further um, define our patients and to try to find the best solution. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Excellent presentation gives us a lot of points we can include to the discussion later. Uh, the next speaker is uh, Dr. Levy from Udine in Italy. Italy is also a country which disastrous situations as in Germany. We just, he just told me in a brief discussion ahead. 
and we are know each other for many, many years because we go in similar wi ways and fight similar battles. <laughs> and so I'm quite eager to hear what he's going to tell us about the X Core as an alternative to ECMO. Please. Thanks, Christoph. Uh, first of all, I would like to th thank the organizers for inviting me to be here and share with you our experience uh, on uh, XCOR BVAD. In, uh, uh, when you compare uh, uh, the BVAD with ECMO, of course, uh, you have to be uh, sure about the data in uh, reported by uh, on uh, ECMO utilization. Uh, this is uh, the uh, very recent report uh, of uh, ECMO in the United States. Uh, you can see 5% uh, of patients uh, are transplanted uh, in uh, ECMO and uh, as a bridge to heart transplantation. Uh, and the, the percentage of uh, this uh, uh, population change uh, recently by the change allocation system in the United States. Before uh, you can see most of patients was bridged uh, with, uh, uh, with the VAD. In, uh, uh, if you look, uh, uh, if you consider the ECMO, uh, is a well known uh, the. Uh, uh, the uh, favorable effects, uh, effects of ECMO in, uh, has been demonstrated to fit uh, for all patients uh, or pathology in, in uh, any condition, clinical conditions. Uh, you can uh, bridge the people to recovery, to heart transplantation, to uh, VAD, and uh, especially indicated as reported here, you know, in, uh, when you need to support uh, also the pulmonary function, in uh, particular indicated in a small BSA, in a complex heart congenital diseases, and so on. And of course, uh, the ECMO advantages uh, are the limited invasiveness, uh, the uh, radio availability. Also, in ICU, you can put a cannula in, in the patient uh, very quickly. In uh, the implantation, is very simple, uh, and also the weaning is also uh, simple in uh, ADZ. Of course, uh, you have uh, the patient uh, uh, on the bed, is uh, now immobilized on the bed, in, uh, with uh, high risk of complication, mainly uh, infective complication, but also stroke or uh, uh, bleeding complication. In uh, the unloading is a, a big problem with ECMO because uh, uh, you have to, um, in, uh, in most of them, uh, you have to unload. Uh, the, the left ventricle in, in, in some way, and uh, or, uh, you have to, uh, to add a different tool to uh, unload the ventricle. And, uh, and the ECMO, you know, is effective for a limited time. And if you use ECMO as a bridge to transplantation, of course, uh, you have to consider you have uh, at least two or three weeks, no more. And uh, in the, the registry of the uh, International Society for Atlantic Transplantation, as you can see, the, uh, the ECMO is a, a the most significant risk factor for one-year mortality uh, following transplantation. In, uh, indeed, uh, you, you see the, uh, the patients uh, transplanted uh, on ECMO, they pay uh, the risk of mortality in the very early period, in the first month. In the first month, the, the mortality is, is around 30%. Then, uh, if you look uh, at the long-term results, uh, the long-term results on, uh, of our transplantation is equivalent to other uh, patients. In, uh, in, but uh, if you selected, you selected properly the patients, you can get better results than reported by the International Registry. This is our experience. In, uh, in uh, 40 patients uh, uh, bridged to heart transplantation uh, with ECMO, you can see the mortality at 30 days uh, is 15 percent. It's uh, not so bad uh, if you select properly the, the patients. Now, in uh, the EXOR can be an alternative to ECMO. You have to compare the results of uh, uh, of a BVAD. In, uh, we know by the registry, in uh, these slides are, are 
little bit old because, uh, as you know, in the States they don't use uh, any BVAD, uh, pulsatile BVAD, in, uh, since many years. In, uh, but uh, as we, historically, we know in, uh, when the right ventricular assist device uh, is uh, uh, added to LVAD, uh, the results uh, are worse. And uh, on the right, you can see the mortality is, uh, is quite different than uh, uh, the outcome is quite different than uh, the outcome uh, obtained with uh, LVAD. In, uh, here is a reported uh, in uh, BVAD uh, a limited number of patients, but uh, is uh, around uh, in the early phase, around 30%. And, uh, and uh, uh, is, uh, in uh, 206 cases anal analyzed, you see the death uh, is 35% uh, uh, in the first six months, uh, and, uh, and the, the most of uh, complication leading to death uh, were infection, bleeding, uh, or neurologic complication. This is our experience. Our experience consisted of 36 patients uh, with a mean age of 56, uh, the, most of them are male, and uh, 60, almost 65 of them were, be, were transplanted, and uh, uh, three of them uh, with uh, fulminant cardiomyocarditis uh, were win, uh, from the, uh, the assistance. In, uh, oh, sorry. In, uh, if you look, uh, of course, uh, in uh, this series, uh, he, he comprised uh, uh, patients in intermass 1 and 2. And, uh, and the, the original pathology was uh, dilated or ischemic cardiomyopathy. In, uh, this is the outcome of, the, uh, of this series. 60, almost 65 patients were transplanted and 80% uh, wind. That means 72, 73% of patients survive, or survive to uh, uh, BVAD assistance with a mortality of 28%, more or less. Uh, the data of, in, just to, look, to have a, a look uh, about, uh, 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 about our data, uh, to, uh, uh, we compare our data with uh, data obtained by a series, uh, a series of uh, uh, patients supported with uh, ECMO, in, uh, in the, uh, we choose uh, a comparable uh, a, a match population in, uh, in ECMO. You see the age is similar. The pre-op uh, findings uh, are very similar, and uh, the only difference is the sex. And uh, in, uh, if you look to hemodynamic uh, echocardiographic before and then hemodynamic uh, data, you, you see just uh, the BVAD patients uh, had uh, more frequent right ventricular failure, a tricuspid regurgitation. This is uh, significantly different than uh, the CLS population. And uh, also the uh, laboratory values, uh, you see the lactate uh, were, were uh, worse uh, in uh, a CLS uh, population. That means uh, the, the population maybe was more in uh, Intermax 1 uh, than uh, 2. In, uh, the outcome of uh, uh, in, uh, BVAD implantation is here reported with, uh, uh, I told you before, 64% were transplanted. Is, uh, the rate is very similar to the ECMO uh, population transplanted in our uh, center. And also the, the, the population uh, of patients wind is more or less the same. Of course, uh, what is different uh, is uh, the duration uh, of assistance. Of course, in uh, SCLS uh, is uh, uh, shorter and longer in BVAD. In, uh, in one case, uh, more than one year, uh, the, the patient was uh, transplanted uh, after more than one year of assistance. The complications uh, are very similar, but uh, specifically, of course, uh, for uh, uh, the SCL people in uh, the femoral site infection was, uh, uh, the, uh, was uh, a significant 
different, uh, more frequent uh, complications, uh, vice versa, in BIVAD, uh, the stainer re uh, re uh, exploration is expected. The, after heart transplantation, uh, the mortality was uh, similar, uh, at least not, uh, uh, not, not different. Uh, uh, statistically, statistically significant, in, uh, the, but the ICU stay uh, was uh, shorter in, uh, in uh, patient transplanted in, in BIVAD. In, uh, uh, the outcome after transplantation is a little bit, bit different between two groups. In the sense, in the BIVAD group, the rate of infection was lower, also the uh, atrial fibrillation and bleeding uh, is uh, much lower. The respiratory failure, you can see as a, a, a underlying the acute renal failure and a need for dialysis were uh, much lower. That means uh, it seems uh, with the patient uh, arriving after uh, more than one month uh, to the transplant, uh, they had, the, they, uh, had been uh, recovered much better than uh, uh, pro when uh, such provided by the SCLS. This is uh, the, our survival after transplantation is uh, around 80%. There is uh, no difference between uh, ECMO, uh, I mean, uh, between uh, patients uh, transplanted uh, on ECMO or, or on BVAD. We, in uh, uh, approaching to my final uh, slides, uh, I can say in uh, the BIVAD, uh, maybe prefer uh, in some uh, particular cases. Uh, of course, uh, when uh, the ECMO is not applicable because uh, uh, the vessel uh, uh, problems, uh, peripheral vessels, uh, in, uh, in, the, in the BIVAD, uh, maybe can assure a better support if you have uh, a uh, amount of volume uh, of perfusion uh, in the sense uh, that you can give uh, much better output, output uh, in, uh, with uh, BIVAD than uh, uh, the ECMO if you have uh, no uh, proper size of vessel just to uh, have uh, the proper cannula size. Also, in, uh, in, in my opinion, BIVAD uh, could be preferred in, in case uh, of uh, heart transplantation time. Uh, I mean, uh, the waiting time for heart transplantation is longer, maybe for different reasons. I, I put here for some uh, uh, problem like uh, very large uh, BSA or, or uncommon blood type or allosensitization. I mean, uh, when you need uh, more time to get a suitable donor, uh, that means uh, you can get uh, a, a donor um, more suitable and uh, a, maybe you can get uh, uh, better results instead to use uh, maybe marginal donors because uh, you rush to transplant the people you know in uh, ECMO when uh, it's passing two or three weeks uh, you, you need to transplant the people. And then finally, in, uh, I put a better recipient uh, need for long term support. Uh, maybe in, uh, you need more time to recover from uh, multi organ failure, or maybe there are some contraindications, uh, temporary contraindications to transplantation. You have to gain time. Of course, you have uh, uh, the need to uh, have uh, a, a support for longer time. Uh, I conclude to say. The uh, BIVAD can assure uh, a support equivalent to a CLS as a bridge to transplant. BIVAD uh, is surgical demanding and uh, more expensive, but in uh, the potential cardiac recovery is much better, maybe because uh, the unloading uh, is more efficient. The more complex multi-organ recovery, as I mentioned the, by the speaker, uh, previous speakers, uh, due to the pulsatility, it seems to have uh, more uh, effective uh, in, uh, in pro uh, just in, in the, in the case in more com complex cases uh, and more difficult cases. And uh, you can have a, a better rehabilitation because uh, you can move the patient, maybe the patient can be discharged and uh, a, a, a recover completely. 
and uh, you can uh, wait uh, for uh, a more suitable donor and uh, uh, maybe you don't need to, to keep uh, a marginal donor, but uh, you can uh, have time uh, to have the, the right donor for the, such patient. And finally, also as demonstrated by our series, uh, the rate of complication on post transplantation seems to be lower because uh, the patient uh, uh, transplanted on BVAD as, uh, in, in better condition with uh, the uh, multi-organ recovery uh, complete. Thank you very much. Professor Levy, thank you very much. This was, of course, very interesting just to see side by side results from ECMO and XCOR BIVAT. Nevertheless, we also saw, and we can discuss it later on, these were rather short support intervals because years ago when these studies and these patients started, the ECMO was always was less ECMO experience, short intervals, and um, uh, the paracorporeal devices were designed as a midterm support. And this brings us to the next topic from our young Rupova from Essen, because nowadays we have the problem everywhere from extremely donor shortage, so short term is hardly ever possible as a bridge to transplantation, whatever we use. And he will talk about from short term to long term VAT, when and how. Please. Dr. Schmidt, ladies and gentlemen, thank you, and also thank you to you for being here at such a late hour. Now, um, these are the new guidelines of the European Society of Cardiology dealing with end-stage heart failure, and as you can see here, the case for end-stage heart failure, chronic end-stage heart failure uh, for mechanical circulatory support is quite solid with a 2A recommendation for long-term mechanical circulatory support. It's similar for short-term mechanical circulatory support when you look at the guidelines for acute heart failure or cardiogenic shock, where we also have a 2A or 2B uh, recommendation of the European Society of Cardiology with regard to uh, treatment of acute heart failure. So if we look at the first Intermax data, you remember the Intermax registry was set up in 2004. As you can see here, the, um, as you can see here, um, when the Intermax registry was set up, the percentage of um, patients with Intermax 1 receiving a durable VAT was almost 50%, 40.8%. 40, 40 and it decreased over the years until 2011 when this paper was published to 14%. And there's a reason for that because we all have learned that uh, once we implant um, a durable VAT too quickly, in those cases, they were usually LVATs because it's in North America, um, the, the results are worse and that's why the paper recommended that we first should put in a temporary assist device so that the patients formally become, uh, go from Intermix 1 to Intermix 3 because then they are stable and then wait for end organ recovery in order to then decide what kind of long-term device or recovery is possible. Now, these are the short-term devices that are available. Dr. Hager already mentioned the balloon pump, which doesn't really play a role. We have the impeller system and we have the ECMO system. And today, I want to concentrate, as we are talking as a, about bridge to bridge to strategy, how we in detail decide when to go for a LVAT and when to go for a BIVAT and when to recover. So, these are the temporary devices that are usually available in every cath lab, easy to use, you usually don't need a pump technician, these are easy to implant ECMO system or ECLS systems. The fact that, that these devices know, we know for the, from the first um, prospective randomized trial that was coming from China showing that in ischemic cardiogenic shock there is a clear survival benefit for patients receiving an ECMO system compared to patients who received optimal medical therapy in those days. Um, this is a patient uh, from my time when I was working in Heidelberg who was re um, admitted from a cath lab where he was resuscitated due to acute myocardial infarction. The patient was already on ECMO with a flow of seven liters, peripheral ECMO, which is quite good considering that it was a peripheral system. But as you can see here, despite a flow of seven liters, we had severe pulmonary edema. And when we look at his TEE, 
film, we see that we have a congested left ventricle runoff of blood from the, from the lung is not possible here. And one can easy imagine, easily imagine that the left ventricular end diastolic pressure is so high that the cardiac recovery is also not possible uh, as with the lung. So we have learned over the years that the peripheral ECMO, no matter how well it works, is not always uh, not always the best solution. And uh, in the past, when we had these patients, we've tried several times to use the ECSCO system as an ECMO, as was suggested now. But in these patients, we all, always had the problem we couldn't get off pump because we still had lung failure. So what we did was we put in an oxygenator, and high, uh, the best oxygenator we had in those days, uh, uh, high, high capacity oxygenator, into the right system of the Berlin Heart System. These the oxygenators are usually designed for continuous blood flow, so it worked for a few days, but none of these patients actually survived. The alternative, of course, is to put in a venovenous ECMO in addition to a BIVAT system, but I think we have better systems than that. Now, when we talk about peripheral ECMO systems, um, uh, Dr. Levy already alluded to that. Limb ischemia is a big problem. We have the Harlequin effect, where we have mixture of, uh, of cardiac output or collision of cardiac output and the ECMO system that is peripheral somewhere in the descending artery where myocardial or cerebral um, uh, ischemia is possible, uh, um, hypoxia is possible. And of course, we have no way of decompress decompressing the left ventricle. So, um, and don't underestimate, we shouldn't also underestimate the, the rate of, of limb ischemia, um, ischemia in peripheral ECMOs. And that's why years ago we developed the system that we put in, always put in a, a central ECMO in these patients, uh, performed the thoracotomy, we put in an, a selective cannula of the ECMO system, of the venous ECMO, uh, ECMO branch, into the left atrium in order to depressurize the left atrium in order to enable the left ventricle and the lung to recover. We could easily measure uh, PO2 in the left atrial cannula to, see, to doc document any improvement of lung function. We could measure the flow. And then um, we would decide at the end whether to put in a BIVAT, and we did this in 20 cases, or not. Now, we analyzed a few years ago uh, the 40 uh, Berlin heart cases we had that we had treated either with ECMO or without ECMO. And um, the patients were divided into two groups. The first group, and that's the first uh, the control group you see here, were patients receiving a BIVAT X score without the previous central ECLS. And the second ECLS group are the patients who all, with no exception, received a thoracic a central ECLS the way I just showed it. Uh, you see here that the, um, in the second group, the majority of the patients had the CP undergone a CPR more than 30, 30 minutes. Um, when you look at the lab values in the ECLS group, the liver enzymes were significantly higher. So these patients were actually much, much sicker. And when you look at the long-term um, survival of these patients, we saw no, at least over several years, and these are old kind of old data, we saw survival of around, long-term survival of around 50%. And if you had the chance to listen to Dr. Kramer's talk this morning, my previous co-worker from Heidelberg, who presented the, the newest data with these patients, uh, it has actually improved a little bit, but we can say that once the patients are transplanted, they have a very good long-term outcome. Now, we of course had a learning curve. These were data in a multi-center study, we, small multi-center study we performed with Zurich and Aachen, where we had a, even a one-year survival with the X-Core BIVAT, very sick patients of 92%. So it's a very good system. It's, it's an old system, but it works. It provides high cardiac output. It's very good in patients who have a septiform circulation, and pa patients who have severe end organ dysfunction, and we can achieve even better results than in some LVAT cases. Now, meanwhile, we have changed our um, ECLS strategy. Uh, we, if the chest is closed and patient, is, it's not a post-cardiotomy case. We usually put in a long venous cannula, as we used to do before. But uh, instead of uh, opening the chest, we prepare the axillary artery on the right side and uh, suture, uh, suture 10 or 12 millimeter Dacron graft onto the vessel and then, then comes in the, the arterial line. And for the patients who are post-cardiotomy, we usually suture a 10 or 12 millimeter Dacron graft onto the aorta um, and then tunnel it onto, uh, outside the chest so that we can easily remove the uh, 
uh, the ECMO cannula, the arterial ECMO cannula on intensive care unit later without reopening the chest. So um, unloading remains a problem if we choose these st strategies, and that's why we increasingly use the um, ECPELA or ECMELA system. So we use, we try to use a central ECLS because we know the disadvantages of peripheral ECLS, then we either use, uh, if, uh, if our cardiologists do that, they, uh, they, we use the 2.5 or a CP impeller, we, or we can use the tandem heart system for the left side. We can uh, additionally cannulate, cannulate over the small anterior mini thoracotomy, left anterior mini thoracotomy, the left ventricle, and there are new devices available for the interventionalist to put in, for example, a shunt on the, on the atrial level or perform a rash can maneuver. Bipolar system is possible, but if you have an oxygenation problem, it's not the right system to use. And that the ECPELA system works well. You see here in nice work from Berlin, from cardiology, um, you see the documentation of left ventricular end diastolic pressure first only with the ECMO system, and once the impeller was turned on, you see that you reduce left ventricular end diastolic pressure presumably enabling a better um, recovery of the left ventricle because the wall tension is less. And the fact that these systems are superior to ECMO alone, you see here, two works from Patel and uh, Papalardo, where they see survival imp improvement with ECPELA patients compared to only ECMO patients. A new study came out last year, also published here, from Schrage, published in circulation, also showing a clear survival benefit for ECPELA system compared to only ECMO system. So it's actually the strategy we have been doing. There are, of course, alternatives. Uh, we in Heidelberg and now in Essen have been implementing the, the temporary RVAT using the Protect Duo cannula very often um, as an RVAT, temporary RVAT system. So you can up, upgrade it with an oxygenator if necessary so the blood is sucked on the level of the right atrium and given back to the pulmonary artery later. And this enables less catecholamines, and for the left side, we use a Impella 5.5 or Impella 5.0 uh, case. So we have um, groin-free patients that have, uh, that have a RVAT, temporary RVAT, either with or without oxygenator over the right jugular vein, and um, a temporary LVAT, full-flow LVAT with the Impella 5.5 or 5.0 over the uh, axillary artery. So only the upper half of the body is, uh, does have cannula, so patients can be easily mobilized. They can walk around with a BIVAT system that is temporary. Now, how do we decide when to put in a BIVAT system? That's always the, the question. We are, we are still on a temporary device. So the first thing we need to do is to improve the right ventricle. And as you can see here, we do everything we already know from transplant or for, from, from, from VAT uh, studies in general. We try to reduce afterload of the right ventricle. We have to get rid of intravasal volume or fluid. And then um, we have our own criteria how to wean the patient off an RVAT. RVAT. That's, that's the first thing we want to do, get rid of the RVAT. And this was published by Dr. Kramer. This has been our, our protocol for weaning patients. It's quite simple and common sense. We want to keep the CVP below 15. We want to have a, C, a central venous saturation over 65%. Um, we, want to, we want good end organ recovery, especially of the liver, for which we don't have any substitute. So we wait for normalization of liver enzyme. Uh, renal function, it's nice if it recovers. If not, we always have a few weeks' time uh, with dialysis. And we try to get the FiO2 below 45%. So this is our strategy. And if that doesn't work, we go, usually go in these patients to a BIVAT system, to the Berlin Heart X score. So the take-home message is that short MCS are excellent devices to first rescue the patient's life, rescue end organ function. Um, we need to do some sort of LV decompression in most cases in order to enable the lung to recover and also give the left ventricle a chance for better perfusion. Um, our goal is organ recovery, high cardiac output, even in septiform patients. We, of course, need to manage the complications. And meanwhile, we use different systems in order to achieve that, both the ECMELA or ECPELA system. Thank you very much. So, Dr. Rupova, thank you very much. This is uh, rather interesting because it brings into play a lot of other devices which are not in everybody's uh, hands available. 
Um, not everybody has experience with Expella or Project Duo or even with Impella. This is uh, new devices and I think we can later have a nice discussion on that topic too. Now the next presentation is our external one from Gothenburg by Sven Eric Bartfei. Is he, well, hello, Dr. Bartfei, nice, welcome. Do you understand us? Yes. Fine. I, I, don't, I don't see you. I've been seeing you for the other presentations, but now I see my own presentation. <laughs> okay, so I'm perfectly hidden. doesn't make a difference because we see you and we see your slides. That's all we need. Yeah. And so uh, thank you very much for accepting this presentation. Uh, you will talk about the decision making with Bayevet versus Elvet. Uh, with high survival in both groups. This uh, concludes very nice on the f uh, former presentation because when uh, we couldn't wean from our weight, which is of course a goal from in most centers and dominates, then we go to the, let's say, normally less favorable biovet, but in your hand, obviously, both are from the same quality. Thank you very much for the presentation. Please go ahead. So thank you for the possibility to present uh, some of our data. Uh, I work as a cardiologist with uh, advanced heart failure transplantation and VAD therapy uh, together with our surgical team, our intensivist team and so on in, at Sahlgrenska University Hospital in Gothenburg. So as we all know and as we have heard, the, the modern ALVAD systems with the third generation pumps, they are most frequently, frequently used also in our center. But we have patients where this is not enough uh, or this is not possible. And these are, for instance, children, adults with complex congenital heart disease and adults in need of biventricular support. We have some data on all these patients group, but today I will focus on the adults in need of biventricular support. Uh, and we also know that the elder patients who suffer from right ventricular failure have a much, much worse outcome than the ones who do not. Uh, we also know that right heart failure is hard to predict. It means an increased risk of postoperative bleedings, reoperations, renal failure and death, as you see in the right graph. And we know that and we also have heard about all the advanced devices that about 20, 10 to 20 percent are in need of some kind of BIVAD. Uh, the question we asked ourselves in, in this work uh, was if you, whether you can achieve a high survival by a de novo biovet strategy in selected patients with a high risk of post-implant bioventricular failure. And this was published in the Journal of Thoracic and Cardiovascular Surgery. Uh, we looked at uh, patients uh, who were considered in need of a VAD as bridge to transplantation. Uh, these were patients, they were discussed on a multidisciplinary transplantation board. Uh, and all the patients in this retrospective study were uh, eligible for either BIVAD or LVAD. Uh, patients who, who were not eligible for bi BIVAD in theory were excluded. So we ended up with 20 patients who got a BIVAD and 21 patients who got an LVAD. And this was a clinical selection. Uh, and the, the study was done afterwards on prospectively collected data, but it was a retrospective analysis. And we looked at long-term survival. So all patients are included both before and after transplantation. We we'll also looked at all the normal things uh, but we also calculated, retrospectively calculated some risk scores for RV failure. And this was a part of our work to optimize patient selection. Uh, this uh, slide is a, is a bit busy, but I will guide you through it. Uh, we can see that the BIVAD group, uh, because they were clinically selected to BIVAD or because of uh, some features in, in their uh, uh, medical history and the very acute phase they were in, they were younger. Uh, they had a non-ischemic cause of their heart failure. Uh, and there were more female patients in the BIVAD than in the LVAD group. 
So if we go to the more echocardiographic and hemodynamic data, we see that the bivalent patients, of course, had the worse right ventricular function because that was a part of the selection process. But they all had also had a more compromised hemodynamics with a lower cardiac index, um, a higher CVP PCVP ratio, and a lower right ventricular stroke work index. If we go to the bottom of this table, we can see that the clear majority of the bivalent patients were in intermax profiles one to two, compared to the elvet patients where only 48% had the low intermax profiles. We also retrospectively calculated two of the risk scores who were, which were proposed in the literature at the time of the study. It was the Matthew score and the Fitzpatrick score. And in our material, uh, the Fitzpatrick score but not the Matthew score was significantly, significantly higher in the BIVAD group. Uh, we didn't use these scores as a part of a clinical routine, but uh, uh, nevertheless, it can be so that we, in the multidisciplinary decisions, looked at parameters that later was included in these scores. If we look at complications uh, after uh, the VAD implantation, we can see that um, uh, major strokes were equal, but we had more minor strokes in the BIVAD group. We had two strokes, that is 10%, but none in the LVAD group. Uh, we had uh, one case of mechanical pump failure in the BIVAD group. So, and if you look at this performance of these risk scores, uh, on this ROC curve, we saw that the Fitzpatrick score uh, performed better than the Matthew score. Uh, but we still think that only risk scores do not uh, uh, participate so much for the selection process. So if you look at the long-term results in, in our patients, we have survival, long-term survival uh, after implantation of the pump in <clears throat> graph A the upper part of this slide, we can see that there was no significant difference in survival between LVAD and BIVAD patients. Of course, the groups were very different, but with the selection we had made, uh, the survival was quite equal and high. If you look at the lower uh, graph, we can see that uh, shows time to transplantation. We see that the BIVAD patients were transplanted uh, more quicker, and that was a part of our prioritization on the waiting list. Uh, in Sweden, waiting times are quite long, but I think, think we have a better situation than in many other countries. Uh, so we could prioritize the bivet patients, and all were transplanted within one year. 50% of the bivet patients were uh, managed after one or two months, they were managed uh, uh, as outpatients, and 50% waited in hospital for their transplantations. So, in conclusion, um, we think that this de novo BIVAD strategy in selected patients seems reasonable. Uh, of course, the, the patients who got the BIVA, they were they had some kind of short time uh, short term assist devices before BIVA, but in in the later years of this this study, uh, we quite early uh, used the X core cannulas and connected them uh, to a short term device, and if uh, the the patients uh, didn't show that the their uh, right ventricle or anything else recovered, then they got the X core pump houses connected to the cannula through a second, much smaller operation. That was the more um, present strategy in these patients. We also think that this, in this material, it applies to younger patients with non-ischemic heart failure and low intermax profiles. And despite these low intermax profiles and a compromised RV function, the long-term survival for patients on BIVAD support was very high, and it was comparable to that observed in our contemporary LVAD patients. Uh, and when it comes to the decision-making, we think that the decision-making we have 
we have used uh, during the study period uh, was uh, quite good uh, and it was uh, based on evaluation of echocardiographic and hemodynamic parameters as well as uh, Looking, on sign, looking at signs of multi-organ failure and the Intermax profile. So patients with multi-organ failure, low Intermax profile, uh, where sometimes we, we took the safe thing first and decided to implant a BIVAD, uh, and in patients uh, quickly recovering from, from multi-organ failure or who had uh, good end organ function and uh, no uh, echocardiographic and hemodynamic signs of severe right heart failure, these patients got an LVAD. And with that um, selection, uh, we achieved good long-term survival in both groups. So that was um, uh, my uh, uh, slides. Uh, we have also done uh, other work where we have looked at all our ex-core patients, uh, but, uh, and we see a similar high survival, including children, uh, but that uh, will be a part of another presentation. Thank you very much. Dr. Bartfoy, thank you very much. This was uh, clearly interesting, especially when we see the good results. We will discuss on the background also, if we still find the time to all these possible discussions at the end. I may now introduce the last speaker, who uh, more or less gives a conclusive idea at the end, what we can do as an alternative. We'd always heard about the problems of the right side. We heard about the problems of longer term support and so Dr. Professor Gabade from Bremen now gives an, an, uh, an overview about the combination of pulsatile and con continuous flow devices in challenging cases, proof of concept. The stage is yours. Dr. Schmidt, uh, thank you for your brief introduction of myself uh, and uh, thank you to Bill and Hart for inviting me to, to share the Leipzig thoughts about uh, the combination of two different uh, concepts uh, just uh, for, for a very, very selected uh, patient cohort. Here are my disclosures. Well, I want to start uh, with a case as a coming with me into the hospital. That's the point where we are. And here I want to show you a case, uh, a young, a young uh, man uh, in the age of 17. Uh, he was... Uh, admitted to us in severe heart failure. He was supported by an ECMO. On top of that, he was also, the LV was also uh, compressed by an uh, impeller system, and uh, the weaning procedure failed in this patient. And so uh, we were on the border uh, to do something to um, help the young, the young guy. And so we were on the intensive care unit with our cardiologist and discussed uh, how would we handle this patient. Well, uh, one of uh, the therapy options could be, could be to implant an, an uh, uh, approved uh, Elvet system to, to uh, recover the left side. And uh, we all know, and we have already heard about that, that we have, uh, in such cases, a very high risk uh, to, to uh, sustain the failed RV or to, to have a, a new uh, RV failure. And that's why I want to share you the current uh, uh, characterization of RV failure from the EC, HA, and ISHLT guideline. And so uh, to keep in mind that not uh, only uh, an uh, RV failure is when we have to implant an active mechanical device, also when we use uh, inotropes or other, other uh, medications to support the RV, then we speak uh, from RV failure. You also uh, uh, know that uh, there's a, a, a not uh, or a very high number of patients uh, in elective cases when you go to the OR and uh, the patient is undergoing an isolated Albert implantation. So we have an expected relatively high rate of uh, patients coming out with an additional temporary uh, Albert system. 
And uh, so it's also known that uh, in those patients uh, we will have a very high rate of uh, mortality, morbidity as well in combination of that uh, with a high amount of additional costs uh, compared to, to isolated uh, uh, Albert implantations. There are uh, many, many risk factors you already have heard from the previous speaker and of course uh, also there are um, uh, prevention strategy to, to uh, prepare the right side uh, pre albert implantation. However, Coming back to the case, I've shown you from my side, I would never expect uh, an, an, an very good shape of the right side when the patient is uh, intermax one or two and he's under uh, ECMO support in addition to an uh, impeller support. And this slide or the, the, the graph you already seen from my previous uh, speaker. And uh, of course, if the right side uh, is failing, of course, you will see a an, an, an very high rate of uh, mortality in compared to those patients without any struggling right side. In addition to that, liver, renal failure, and et cetera, et cetera, you will see in the post-operative uh, course. Risk models, there are many, many models available you can use uh, and you can calculate uh, the risk of right heart failure, but from my from my point of view and for, for, for my decision making, uh, I always look uh, to the patient, I uh, look to the lab values, I speak with uh, my colleagues, and uh, that is uh, always uh, the basis for our decision making to manage the right side and uh, to make the decision for an early uh, active right heart uh, support device. Now, Coming back to our patient, and then you are discussing uh, potential uh, surgical strategies, how to deal with the patient. We have heard the option of temporary active uh, support devices, ECMO, uh, Impella, uh, Levotronics, or whatever. Then we have the option to use a more durable long-term uh, device, Bivet X-Core or the RV X-Core for the right side. We can use the more invasive method of a total artificial heart, or the sandwich technique using uh, the uh, uh, double continuous flow uh, technique. However, there are any other native co concepts, and that was the basis to think about new concepts to combine the good sides of the LV therapy we know we are uh, familiar with, and com uh, combine uh, for the right side the good sites or the good experience we have with uh, approved uh, long-term active support uh, X-Core Berlin Heart and bring both together as a new strategy for a very highly selected patient cohort to help them to overcome the problem either as a recovery strategy or as a bridge to transplant strategy. So that was the, the, the basis for our uh, decision making. We know if you use uh, the continuous flow device, there are uh, two or three different publications showing uh, good results or acceptable results. However, this uh, technique is an off-label use technique and you have always uh, to, to ask the patient or the relatives before you're doing such a procedure. And on the other hand, you always have to discuss uh, with the insurances about the costs. Then we know the excellent data we have from the paracorporal uh, devices uh, for use for treating the uh, ARVID. And that was uh, the basis to, to combine the excellent impact of uh, pulsatility to the uh, pulmonary uh, uh, pressure or the pulmonary vascular architecture, what we know from different animal studies, and uh, to, to keeping in mind that that is always a problem when the patients go to a heart transplantation, that he very often, uh, that the right side is struggling and that the patient came out of the transplantation supported by an ECMO, for instance. And that was uh, our thinking to combine both technologies uh, and, and, and durable uh, uh, continuous flow device for the left side, as we're very, very close with the technology and with a uh, pyrocorporal orbit at Bollinghorn X core, keeping in mind as a bridge to recovery for the right side or as a bridge to uh, transplantation strategy. 
here you see our our first case. Uh, we we performed an one a single one single stage a straightforward procedure implanting LVET for the left side uh, in combination with the implantation of a Berlin Hunt X core for the uh, right side. The situs uh, was completely prepared for later heart transplantation or, or an explantation. You see the outdoor craft, uh, outdoor crafts were covered by a second craft and protected uh, by a membrane to, to uh, have a very easy entry uh, for the next uh, procedure. And again, it was not a staged, it was a single staged straightforward uh, procedure in all patients with it. Here is the post-op uh, overview of both working systems. It was very, we achieved a very good function of both devices in parallel. Of course, you had two different controllers uh, bedside and sometimes it was a little bit confusing to, to, to uh, interact with both uh, systems, but in the end of the day, it was very easily to achieve a very stable uh, 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 hemodynamic. Here I want to share you with our data we achieved in Leipzig. In total, we treated four patients in a straightforward uh, single stage procedure. The age was very, very, we had very, very young patients in the middle age of uh, 35. Uh, all patients uh, were in Intermax 1 or 2, and uh, uh, two-thirds of all patients were treated uh, or they were on ECMO or uh, uh, on impeller support. And uh, in all patients, uh, the initial procedure was very uh, uneventful and without any severe complications during uh, the primary uh, implantation. We're coming to the data I want to share with you. Uh, firstly, uh, outcome on hybrid uh, VAT and secondly, uh, post-transplant. Uh, um, we had only one re-expiration for bleeding. You know, that's a very big uh, procedure, and uh, so bleeding is uh, not so uncommon. Uh, we had uh, two uh, chamber exchanges uh, per, per, uh, per person. That was relatively high uh, for, for, uh, for us. And here you see the time on hybrid. More than 100 days, uh, the patient were on the hybrid uh, uh, VAT strategy. In the end, all patients were transplanted. No patient uh, uh, was supported post-transplant uh, with an ECMO or on other active mechanical support devices, and we observed no right heart failure. That was very impressive to, to me because uh, right heart failure is often a problem after, after heart transplantation. And uh, in the end of the day, it's very important that all patients are alive and can discharge. And here you see the uh, days uh, of hospitalization. The patient were 40 days uh, discharged after transplantation. And in totally, they were around 130 days at the hospital. And here you see also the survival. Fortunately, Keeping in mind that it's only single center experience uh, from one surgeon, uh, we all patients uh, alive uh, are still alive, and that is, of course, for me, gives me a, a huge motivation to to uh, work on this uh, concept. Here, you see uh, one of our uh, patients on on the on the hybrid wet with the X core big uh, console as well as on the mobile console. Uh, so that was uh, uh, very, relatively very friendly, and on the on the right side, in combination with uh, the controller bag from from the Elvet. And here, uh, it's a very good uh, case. It was it was our first case. You have uh, seen the initial echo on on chest ray, and he was also successfully transplanted after hybrid uh, supporting. And it's always a very good uh, feedback uh, to have that the patient is. Uh, Good, uh, good back in, in, in your own life, is uh, uh, motivated, he is interested in, in doing many things, meaning he is back in his normal life with a high quality uh, uh, of life. Based uh, on this uh, concept, uh, the combination of uh, uh, the advantages of two different uh, um, uh, MCS systems, uh, there are a big five, meaning that so far we have uh, 
10 patients uh, in Germany were treated by this concept. Uh, coming back, four patients uh, from Leipzig, they were treated in a single center or in, in, in a one-state procedure, and the other six patients uh, were upgraded post elevat and post-temporary ARBIT support, uh, became an ELVET, uh, hybrid ELVET or hybrid uh, VET uh, support uh, after the uh, weaning from the temporary ARBIT was failed. And uh, on the right side, you see the outcome. Uh, nearly 70% are, are alive, transplanted, or uh, ongoing, and one-third uh, uh, was uh, died because of uh, other problems. So I hope uh, that uh, the Essen Group will publish the data very soon to share the complete data set with you and uh, to, to, to yeah, bring this new concept uh, in our community. Well, keeping in mind, only one single center data I've shown you. It's just a an, an bailout solution in a very sick uh, but very young uh, patient cohort where the risk for uh, uh, long-term failing right side is very high, meaning uh, intermax level one and two, patient on, 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 on uh, uh, active temporary support when the patient is admitted uh, to, to a center and is not no randomized uh, prospective trial, and uh, maybe also bias that is only uh, uh, one single center and uh, one man show here. What is the take home message? Of course, I think we all, uh, we all have the same opinion that uh, the left or the elbow therapy is uh, it's, uh, a therapy we can offer with very, very high success to, to our patient. However, uh, there is a very high rate of uh, patients struggling with the right side, so we have to think uh, to how to deal with, with the problem after a temporary ARVID support is also failed. And so we have uh, different, uh, different ways. For my understanding, when the right side is in a chronic uh, uh, failure status, so we have to offer a more, more long-term device. For my understanding, the paracobral pulsatile XCO device. So we have tested that that concept is, uh, is usable, is feasible, and uh, we can achieve uh, very good hemodynamics and very good clinical results. And um, the um, adverse event rates we have seen in our own data we are very, very low, and the patient were mobile, and uh, in our cohort, all patients uh, uh, were successfully uh, transplanted. Also, you have also uh, the potential to wean the patient from the temporary ARVAD so that you can quite easily explant uh, the uh, pulsatile ARVAD maybe just uh, one, uh, six months later or, or, or later. Well, Based on the data we have, based on the data uh, we have in Germany, there's a prospective um, a multi center trial initiated to uh, investigate uh, the impact of this uh, concept or to investigate the concept of the pulsatile effect of a paracobral device in patients supported with a continuous flow for the left side. And uh, I hope. Uh, that this study will be start very, very soon to, to uh, have uh, maybe a high amount of evidence for a small patient cohort in combination left heart failure and uh, sustained right ventricular failure. Thank you so much. Professor Gabardo, thanks very much. Now the time, of course, is forwarded more than we wanted to, but we still can think at a couple of minutes. Are there any questions from the floor? Well, if, yeah, there is one, please. I, um, I just have a question for Professor Gabardo. As he said, <laughs> as he said um, all four hybrid VATs were implanted um, simultaneously. So why did you decide not to try with a um, temporary AVAT? And uh, I, I um, expected the question, of course, because uh, many of the uh, VAT surgeons uh, prefer to implant an isolated AVAT and then see in wait or use a temporary AVAT support 
But uh, going back to our demographics, 75% uh, uh, were on ECMO support, uh, one patient on ECMELA support, and uh, if you remember the chest ray and uh, the uh, uh, echo, uh, so that the expected um, right heart failure or that uh, the potential for recovering of the right heart failure was from my, from my perspective, uh, very low, because uh, we, we tried several times to wean the patient before we started uh, with the surgical procedure, and we saw echocardiographically that the geometry of the right side was terrible. There was no regular shape, no regular configuration, uh, severe tricuspid recurgitation, and that was uh, the reason for me and the team in Leipzig to make a straightforward procedure to, to minimize the risk for an, an additional second look for a potential upgrade to a to an, uh, long-term durable uh, ARVAT system. So you would always su suggest to, like, when the patients are on ECMO, if you have a failing ECMO weaning, then go straight forward to this approach? Even in patients uh, when they are eligible for heart transplantation and uh, when that's, that's the cohort I would recommend this strategy, but not in DT patients, because you, will have, you have no, no, no uh, way out if you will be in trouble, because there's no option for heart transplantation, or, or if, you, if you expect uh, a high potential for a right heart recovery, uh, then I would also use uh, this technology. Okay. okay, let me stay on your side and be a little bit provocative. What's for you the difference not to use an X-core BiVAT instead? Because the BiVAT left side, the left pulsatile device, makes higher pressure, larger flows, better unloading. So why do you still insist on the implant LVA? This is what you have to explain. Anyhow, the problem is you want to bring these patients home, which is much easier with one device as compared to have two controllers at your side. Yeah, you're absolutely right. Uh, that's a very important question. But uh, I try to push your thinking uh, to use more the, uh, the good things we know from a chronic long-term LVAT therapy compared to long-term BIVAT therapy using the paracorporal uh, 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 X-core device. So uh, the longest data we have for a BIVAT up to one, two years, and that's it. But with the continuous flow uh, device, we have data up to 10 years uh, in, in, in some cases. That's why I'm, I'm closer to the continuous flow device. It's more, less invasive compared to the huge cannula uh, to the uh, uh, X-core uh, burden heart system. That's why I, I, I would uh, combine, again, both uh, technologies, because we know that the Elvet continuous flow for the left side, we have very, very good uh, uh, data. We have a very low uh, complication profile. And for the right side, we have nothing rather than the paracorporal X-core device. Yeah. Well, I agree, but let's say to be still provocative, for me, the great advantage is not to have a double noisy device and not the big tubes. But on the other hand, you have a, the whole mechanism is as strong as its weakest part, and the weakest part is the right side. So it doesn't matter whether the left side runs for 100 years or for five years, you have to do the transplant anyhow at an early convenience point, and you did the transplant on average on 100 days. So with 100 days, everything is perfect. Okay, then, then arises the question, what will you do when the patient is on BIVET and uh, uh, the right side recovered, but not the left side, and he will stay on uh, the left heart uh, support uh, for the next couple of years. So you explant the right side, and the patient goes home with an x core device for the left side. This is something really never happens. <laughs> Maybe. Yeah. Because all the biobats we do are uh, in favor of a transplant. But there's another question. 
various failed ECLS weaning attempts on your patient cohort. If I notice right, so the mean stay on ECLS was just five days? Five plus, yeah. Yes, yeah, so, so what do you think is or how many time would you give your patients either to recover or to get in a better shape? And, and what's the ideal time point to actually switch to, a, to another device? That's, that's also a crucial uh, point because if you stay very long on ECLS, you will, have, uh, you will get more and more uh, complications in regard to bleedings, the inflammation will rising up, etc., etc. And that's why for me it's a cut off between five and uh, seven days on ECLS to, to find or to make a decision. So that's maybe I, I, I'm very aggressively in the, at this, for, for this topic, but uh, to stay longer than seven days, uh, my experience, the patient will become trouble with bleedings, infection, and so on. And we, we, saw, we saw the chest ray uh, from, from, from uh, Essen and, and Heidelberg with the, with the lung edema, and we have a high risk for Harlequin syndrome, uh, trouble with the leg perfusion, etc., etc. And so that's why wait five days, uh, perform an echo on TE, reduce uh, the ECMO flow, see what's happened, give some support, give some catheter mind, see what's going on with the contraction what is doing the shape of the right side, and when there is nothing, then of course, then you have to make a decision, go forward for mm. an, an, an upgrade yeah. to an assist device. Let me just intervene and ask uh, Dr. Hagel a question in this regard, because he told us, and it's all about the right ventricle, obviously, we saw in all these presentations, uh, the indication for right ventricular assist is when I have a severe tricuspid regurgitation and an RV pressure above 15. Well, this is a very gen general statement, and uh, if we would look through LVAD patients outside, many patients would have these findings, despite being with an acceptable quality of life. When you do transplants in LVAD patients, you always see a subclinical RV failure with quite edematous tissue and uh, high tricuspid regurgitation, where numerous studies show that it doesn't make a, a difference on mortality rates only on, let's say, quality of life. Isn't it not important to be more precise to look whether you see, we, not, we, we say oh, that prediction is difficult, but to look, for example, on the ECMO, how the ventricle is shaped, how it's looking, it's always a gut feeling, but just uh, to, to make it such a liberal statement, if I have a high tricuspid and RIB on 50, do you always go for a right ventricle no, I support? No, I wouldn't go in, in all cases for a right ventricular support, but um, you said it before, um, it's kind of a gut feeling. Yeah. And we have these different scores, and we do the scoring, and then we look at, at the echo, and then you have people saying, well, I think it will go or it will not go. And uh, in combination with, uh, with um, uh, poor liver function, this is a very important part yeah. for me. If you have a patient, and, this kind of, and I come back to that, what um, Dr. Gabade said, um, you have a patient on ECMO, and after five days, the bilirubin is not going down, but it's going up, then you definitely need something brutal, I would say. And this is two uh, pulsatile pumps. And these are the ones which are not Intermax 1, in my opinion. They are Intermax 0. Yeah. Yeah? These are the really, really sick ones. And for those, we have two pulsatile pumps, and that makes absolutely sense. Yeah. And for the others, I wouldn't go with the pulsatile one, actually, but I would go with a continuous one. But as I showed, um, in 50% of the patients, you may end up with a problem. And we know people who get um, extra device as a, after, let's say, 10 days, 20 days, 30 days of right ventricular support, they all die. Okay. Just let me give you one more question to Dr. Levy, because this goes into the right direction. The problem is when we still dare to go for an implantable VAT, if you use a bilirubin S7 and put in a bivat, the chances of failure are still very high. And um, Dr. Levy just compared ECMO and X-Core, but what is kind of a provocative, maybe also a little bit of criticism, these are very long-term data, and numerous experiences with regard has changed, especially now during the pandemic side. 
and also from XCOR, and we have much better management, the recent decade, than, let's say, 20 years ago. And so we have a lot of situations. That's not only the liver function, which, of course, I see also very crucial. But, uh, for example, when you have a patient who is intubated post-resuscitation, what would you do? Would you still go, if it's a young guy, excellent condition, would you still go for the X-Core? Or do you, would you use the ECMO to, have this, to see the patient waking up and see that he's neurologically intact? Mm -hmm. Yeah, good question. Of course, uh, I agree with you in the sense uh, when you have uh, the patient uh, in so bad condition uh, and maybe he's arrested uh, before, you have to check uh, uh, the neurological status uh, before go ho over, you know, with uh, more uh, com uh, complex assistance. We started with uh, ECMO, and uh, we gained time, uh, we uh, stabilized the patient condition, and then uh, we evaluate uh, the neurological status uh, and uh, uh, the clinical status on overall. And then we decide how we, we can move over, you know, in, with uh, more sophisticated assistance. We need sometimes a few days to, to get the, uh, to evaluate the situation. And, uh, and then, uh, you know, we'll, we're in time to promote another assistance just in case uh, if the, the, the neurological status is fine. And uh, all the other organs is uh, at least preserved in their function. Okay, let's make it a little bit complicated for Dr. Bartfoy. Because when I saw your slides, you had, uh, let's say, for the bi, but surprisingly young patients. The average age was 40 years. We hardly ever see these patients because our patients on average are between 50 and 60, most of them even beyond. So when you get a patient who is really young, but let's say he has been resuscitated, he had an aspiration, so he developed pneumonia and acute renal failure, but he's 25 and uh, CT is normal, sensory potential unremarkable, and uh, you have a right heart failure. Would you still go right away for the bivet for these patients? Yes, that's a very good question. We, we had a lot of patients, perhaps not all of them with pneumonia, but many of these patients were resuscitated and, and uh, about 60% perhaps, or, or 50, 60 on, on ECMO. And uh, as the previous speaker, we, we evaluate them, uh, but quite quickly, within uh, three, four, five days. Uh, and uh, then you also have a, some kind of gut feeling, but if they don't <clears throat> be better, if they have some kind of multi-organ failure and right heart failure, and uh, are still perhaps on ventilator or need uh, intensive care dialysis and so on, then we, we uh, <clears throat> went to central BIVAD with the uh, uh, X-Core cannula, but we didn't connect it to the pump houses directly. Mm -hmm. And then we uh, watched for, for further end organ uh, and neurological recovery. And then we switch to the XCOR pump houses in the second procedure. Thank you. That's exactly what we do too. So, the, the, let's say the obvious cannula expert here is Dr. Rupawa. What would he do with all these Ekpella, Protecto, Biovat, Venting? What would you do in these cases? Well, I, I'm glad you asked. That's what I actually wanted to say. <laughs> um, I understand all the arguments, and Dr. Gabade is right that what do we do if we have an LVAT system or, or a temporary BIVAT system and we cannot wean the patient off from temporary RVAT? What, uh, ECMO is always a problem. What, what makes the side if bad side effects of the ECMO is the, uh, the presence of an oxygenator. And the ECMO per se does not allow us to take out the oxygenator. So we have two, uh, only two choices once we cannot wean the patient. We either implant uh, long-term uh, RVAT, like a X core or we, if we have a, if we have a protect duo cannula, we just take out the oxygenator because uh, so both are systems that can stay in the body longer. So I remember the longest patients we had on the protect duo cannula with the tandem heart are up to two months. 
So it, you don't have the pressure you have with ECMO patients because for ECMO patients you have two weeks and then the bleeding complications start, etc. But if you have some sort of RVAD, be it x core or be it um, 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 a protect dual cannula with a tandem heart, for example, then you, you have no oxygenator, and, and that allows a much longer support time. And uh, of the 10 patients Dr. Gavada mentioned, a few were operated by us, and we had a slightly different approach that we waited um, until um, we could get the patients off the temporary RVAT. It wasn't possible, and then we put in a, temp, uh, a long-term X-core RVAT as bridge to transplantation. Um, so I think ECMO, as long as we only use ECMO as a temporary VAT, we, have, we will encounter the problems Dr. Gavada just said, because we need, we have a time pressure of maximum of two weeks before the onset of bleeding complications and the ECMO, and then we need to decide something. But if we have, um, if we have a, as an intermediate solution, for example, with the Protect Duo cannula, it gives us more time. And we know from the paper of Bob Cormos that Dr. Gavada said, dealing with RV complications after LVAT implantation, the first six weeks are decisive. If the patient survives the first six weeks, then uh, survival remains constant. But the first six weeks are essential. Not only two weeks that we use with ECMO, we need a system that goes up to six weeks or longer, and then we can still decide what to do. So I may disagree at some points. Okay. <laughs> because my, in general, you're right. But I think that we have two major problems. The first statement I would make is, to be provocative as well, again, we could do everything if we could transplant the patients in time. Sure. Yeah, sure. Like in Sweden, with, if I could transplant a patient within one year or within six months, like we did 20 years before, you can do everything. Everything will work. The situation to have an LVAT and to have to use a long-term secondary RVAT is always a problem and will remain a problem. The only thing is to do a fast transplantation. The other thing is the Protec, Impella, and also ECMO is, in, to my point of view, a matter of experience. We are an ex one of the largest centers for ECMO in Europe, and we do bridge to transplant with ECMO, which I really hate, but I have no other option. I still have now an old lady which never qualifies for an LVAT, never even for a paracorporeal device. She can only undergo a transplantation if she awaken everything, because all the patients we have for paracorporeals are resuscitated 100%. And she is not still good enough even for a paracorporeal device, and she has such a small heart so at the end, we could only do a transplant, small ladies. But we don't get the heart, so I'm sure it doesn't work. But with ECMOs per se, if you are experienced, you can easily bridge them for two or three months. The same way you can do with Protec. We used a combination like Protec also, but Protec is very expensive. We just used a single lumen cannula like a swan gans catheter and used the femoral vein, so we had a temporary RAT, and it works perfectly. You're absolutely right. You have, if you are rid of the oxygenator, you get rid of the inflammation, you get rid of the coagulation disorders, which in many patients come after two, three, four weeks, but sometimes even later. But if you are lucky enough, and you have your good system, allocation system, and that's what other countries do, you can go really from ECMO to transplants within two or three months, and it's, it's, uh, it's not easy, Never, nothing is easy in that business, but it's not impossible. So this, this is the minor point I disagree. <laughs> Do we have any further comments, please? Just, just one comment. I, I think it's a good solution, but having, not having a blocked groin is a major advantage when it comes to mobilization on intensive care. Yeah. And that's the only thing, the only advantage I see uh, in, in, in a double lumen cannula to, uh, compared to a to, to, um, Absolutely. Know, to cannulation. Absolutely. That's, that's all. We also try to do cannulation on the axillary side for, for it's everything. Nothing is perfect. Yes. But the yes. advantage of the Protec is that you can remain one groin free. Right. Absolutely. Right. Totally disagree. Even if it's a, a high pricey solution. Yeah. <laughs> Good. I think we could discuss forever, but if ours is okay, I think 
we promised to be finished at about half past ten, which we passed now by five minutes. So I think I don't need another conclusion because this was already a very good one. Um, thank you very much for coming to this uh, interesting session. It is clearly some benchmark remarkable results were presented from five very different but also very fantastic sites. Very, job, very good jobs were done. And thanks to the Berlin Heart, the only company which nowadays makes us this possible. And uh, I'm using, as RS knows, uh, the X Core since, I don't know, decades at least. Mm -hmm. <laughs> okay. Thank you very much for coming and have a nice evening.